Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in California and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESTCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research to develop reliable tools for assessing the environmental risks of PFAS. First, Dr. Paul Tretniak from the Oregon Health and Science University will talk about methods for evaluating fate determining physical chemical properties of most PFAS. Paul's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Then Dr. Chris Solis from Townsend University will discuss an effective model for understanding the factors that influence the bioaccumulation of PFAS in freshwater fish. Chris's talk will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible uh, browser like Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you're unable to view your slides or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and a 5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join bot Audio button, select test speaker and microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use, use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties, because the Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. In case of continued difficulties, feel free to download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Note that we will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERTIP and ESCCP YouTube channel and the link is shown here. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to submit them well in advance of the Q&A session. And when you do submit your question, please make sure to add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A session. The next few slides will provide a quick overview for those of you that are not familiar with CERTUP and ESCCP. CERTUP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTUP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management approaches. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which uh, we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed primarily to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all of ESCCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESCCP are complementary programs with much of the CERTIP research occurring at the lab and or pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESCCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are funded. 
There are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by CERDIP and DSCCP with the underlining goal of sustaining DOD ranges, facilities, and operations. This, as you can imagine, is a broad undertaking. It takes the form of looking at maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate change impacts, unexploded ordnance and munitions constituents, as well as other environmental drivers. One key environmental driver is the reduction of both current and future environmental liabilities. This involves addressing contamination from past practices, including impacts to groundwater, soils, and sediments, UXO contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. The second part of this is pollution prevention with a focus on eliminating likely environmental pollution, pollutants or hazardous materials in manufacturing, maintenance, and operations on DOD installations. We have several main focus areas for research and demonstration at CERDAP and ESCCP, and they are shown here. Specific to this webinar, um, you'll see that CERDAP and ESCCP are funding a broad range of PFAS-related projects. And the two projects you're hearing about today fall under that umbrella. You can access an overview of our PFAS program as well as project descriptions using the link shown at the bottom of this slide. The boxes along the top of the graph illustrate workshops that have been held to develop a strategic plan for addressing PFAS issue. A summary report was prepared uh, for each workshop to summarize the discussions, and, it, I, and, and the discussions um, identified research, demonstration, and technology transfer needs. To view workshop reports, you can just click on the associated box, and it'll take you to a web page where you can download the report. The third up statements of need are specific topics. Re released as part of the annual solicitation that described the area, the research areas of interest for that fiscal year. So you can click on a statement of need. You'll be able to view a summary of the research need as well as a list of projects selected for funding under that statement of need. Within these summaries, each project title links to a full description of the project as well as any sort of reports that have been published as part of that project. Each ESTCP topic listed represents a single topic. So you just click on the project title and it takes you directly to the project webpage. I hope you'll be able to use this amazing tool um, and, and put it to work to get more familiar with the sort of an ESTCP uh, PFAS research program. Finally, uh, technology transfer is very important within CERDAP and ESTCP. Um, T2 efforts include the development of videos, training workshops, and guidance documents, with the webinar series being a very substantial component of um, CERDAP and ESCCB T2 efforts. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from all of our five program areas. Upcoming, upcoming topics include natural resource management through unmanned, unmanned aircraft system technology, uh, demonstration and validation of new non-invasive technology to assess contaminant storage in low permeability media and rock matrix, corrosion mitigation and predictive analysis for DOD weapon systems. And um, the next PFAS webinar is in August on treating PFAS source zones. Registration is open for webinars throughout the year, throughout 2022, actually through early 2023. So you can go to the um, webpage, uh, to the link uh, shown on the next slide and find additional information about upcoming webinars um, and register for them. Also at this link, you'll find um, that past webinars are archived and can be accessed um, here. Please save the date for the 2022 CERDAP and ESCCP Symposium, which will be held November 29 to December 2 in person in Arlington, Virginia. This event will showcase the um, latest technologies that enhance 
uh, DOD's mission to improve environmental and energy performance. I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from the webinar webpage. Look at the chat box um, to see what that link is. Um, and we would appreciate it uh, at the end if you could please complete a very short survey that will pop up on your screen to help inform future webinar efforts. Um, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Paul Kretnia, who is a professor in the School of Public Health at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Prior to that, Paul served as an NRC postdoc at the US uh, EPA lab in Athens, Georgia, and as a research associate at the Swiss, Swiss Federal Institute for Water Resources and Water Pollution Control. Paul's areas of research have expanded from the use of zero valent iron or ZDI for treating contaminated water to include most aspects of in-situ chemical um, reduction and oxidation, including some of the earliest work on the abiotic reduction of groundwater contaminants. Much of Paul's work has targeted chlorinated solvents and explosives, but it also applies to emerging contaminants like 123TCP and PFAS. A cross-cutting theme in most of Paul's work is the use of correlation analysis to develop predictive models for contaminant fate determining properties. Paul received his doctoral degree in applied chemistry from the Colorado School of Mines. Paul, we're really happy to have you. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Ruler, for that introduction, and thanks to CERTIP for inviting me to give this presentation today. So the backstory behind this work is the work is the results of the project that we've been doing for CERTIP ER201481, which is coming to a close soon. But I've given the presentation a more general title because I want to start out by approaching the problem with a with a broader context, which I think will be appealing and, and more uh, uh, useful to, to the bulk of the, of the audience we have here. Um, so the, the, the um, starting point in this presentation is, is going to be, has to do with the, uh, the, the environmental fate and, and, and modeling of, of contaminants. And so uh, I picked to, for the first slide here, a, a, a figure that probably many of you have seen before from the US Geological Survey that illustrates the, the pathways that contribute to the, the fate and effects of, of any particular environmental contaminant, in this case, a surface water system. And the point here is simply to, to remind you that the way that these kinds of reactive transport models are formulated, you have reservoirs of contaminants, say the sediment or the soil or the fish or, or the atmosphere. And those reservoirs are connected with uh, fluxes that are, that are represented by the arrows. And, and those, those uh, describe either transport or various kinds of transformations. And in the scope of this work here today, we're not talking about transformation at all. We're talking only about uh, transport, transport in the sense of transport between phases, partitioning between, between different phases. So the, you're all familiar with this kind of modeling and you know that you can write differential equations to go with all those arrows and then you can put them together in, in, a, in a model and solve, the, um, solve those equations. And then you can simulate what happens to the, chem, the chemicals throughout the environment. And that's kind of ultimately what we're aiming for here. I want, but before I go further with that, I wanna remind you all that there's a, actually a considerably broader context for, the, for this approach in the work that we're doing here. And that is in the more explicitly biological or toxicological realm. So the whole universe of, of research and, and applied modeling that, that's known as PBPK modeling, physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, is it's a big field. And those models work the same way. They have reservoirs for the different compartments in, in the biological system. The reservoirs are connected by arrows that represent the fluxes. And in both this case and in the, in the reactive transport model case in the previous slide, those are all parameterized by, by, by uh, properties that have to be assigned to, to, those, to those arrows in order to be able to simulate the system. And so what we're after here 
with this uh, project and this presentation is the question of how do we get parameters to run these models. And so I wanted to, to say a few more general words about that uh, before we get into the specifics of what we're doing with respect to PFAS here. So in, in the modeling, this kind of modeling, uh, you can conceptually break the universe into sort of into two parts. There's the chemical property aspect of it, and then there's the environmental property aspect of it. And, and so I've to illustrate that, I've drawn down below here a, a kind of a continuum diagram where on the left side here, we have the properties of, of the, the contaminant. So this is like chemical properties. And on the right side, we have the properties of the, the system, so the environment. And on the far left edge, those would be purely uh, chemical contaminant properties. So some, I mean, a, a really clean example would be molecular weight. On the right side of it, uh, a purely environmental property would be something like temperature. Um, the properties that we're concerned with here, interestingly, are, are a little bit in between. And I've listed uh, several of them here. Uh, KOW for octanol water partition coefficient, uh, Henry's law constant, pKa. Those are properties of the contaminant molecule, but they're also influenced by the, the system that they're assigned to. And so that adds a little bit of, of, uh, of, of complexity to how we, how we define these properties. I point out before I uh, move on here that to make a link to Chris's presentation after mine here, you could, you could expand this, this uh, continuum diagram I drew here to include his system by adding a third pole that represents the receptor organism. And then the rest of the conceptual model would, would extend rather nicely. So now we're concerned here with these properties and we're gonna call them physical chemical properties and in some places we'll abbreviate that PCHPs. And I've listed a bunch of them here, uh, KH, SW, Henry's law constant, solubility in water, octanol water partition coefficient, et cetera. And down below, I've, I've kind of reiterated those with a conceptual model cartoon where I've listed some of those same properties on the left side, the more pure chemical ones like Hen uh, Henry's law constant, uh, water solubility and partition coefficient into an organic phase like octanol. On the right side, I've listed some similar ones that are more complex because they're more dependent on the environmental system characteristics like soil organic uh, KOC, partitioning to soil organic carbon, et cetera. Now, the main point of this slide here is the part in the middle. And uh, so I've shown in the, in, the, in the white circle, I've shown a generic structure for a PFAS-like molecule. So you see that it's a polymer of, of perfluorinated function, functional groups. And on the right edge of it is a carboxylate group. And so that would be like uh, any of the perfluorinated carboxylic acids is in this case. All this applies to the sulfonates um, also, but, but I won't, I'm not showing all that here. The key point here is that the pKa of that group is quite low. And so that group will dissociate under environmental conditions to the structure that's drawn to its right, which is the corresponding carboxylate anion. That double-headed arrow that's in between them two is, is, is parameterized according to the pKa. I, I want to emphasize that because the pKa is so low, the speciation of all these chemicals in environmental systems is strongly in favor of that anion. And so we, we really need to rethink how we approach the problem of getting uh, these physical chemical properties for these uh, contaminants because we're dealing with these charged species. In contrast, traditionally, most contaminants that we're concerned with are, um, are neutral, and so we don't have that complication. And there's further, there's two other arrows down here that represent further complications. The one I'll just mention quickly here is that you can, you can uh, form a weak bond between the anion of the carboxylate and other cation in the system and form an ion pair. And normally in environmental chemistry, we ignore that. But uh, in the case of the PFAS system, it's beginning to look like that might be important, but we don't have time to say much more about that today. So now the question where, where the, what we're really headed to here is the problem of how do we get numbers to, for those properties in order to be able to run these models. And I've summarized some just general considerations about that here. 
for most of you, the way that you would first approach this is simply to go and look for someplace where those numbers are tabulated for you by somebody else that spent the time to curate those numbers. And, and a really highly recommended place to go for that right now would be EPA's, uh, uh, what do they call it now, chemical, chem com tox chemicals dashboard. And, the, and this is quite an extensive effort on their part to compile these kinds of property data. If you go in there and look, look up, say, one of the PFAS compounds, you'll find a, a surprisingly large no, number of values. But keep in mind a couple things. One of them, as I'll show you in a minute, the reliability of those numbers is unclear. And uh, two, there are a mixture of measured values and calculated estimated values. And so not all of them are directly derived from experimentation. And we'll play those two things off against each other in the next couple of slides. On the right side of this figure, I've also illustrated another aspect of this, which is that when it comes to modeling these, these, these properties, so predicting these properties, there's two distinctly, distinctly different approaches that one might take. There's this purely statistical approach, which some of you will recognize is how a QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship, typically works. Um, and there are purely theoretical approaches where you get the, a quantum chemical model that can calculate the properties you need from fully from first principles. The, in most cases, neither one of those, many cases, neither one of those is entirely satisfactory. So what we're doing here is we're hybridizing those two things and we're, we're working them together. And I'll show you that in a moment. So one last thing about statistical methods, I wanna emphasize that that they're all based on generically what's called correlation analysis. And that simply means basically plotting one thing against another and looking for patterns on the assumption if things are related, they should show ordered behavior. And, and I just wanted to illustrate the, this, the utility of that for all of you, even the non-academically minded of, among you, that you can use that not only for predicting properties or for diagnosing process-related questions, but you can also use it for simply verifying the consistency or reliability of the data. And the figure on the right is there to illustrate that the, exactly what the, those numbers are is completely irrelevant today. The point is just that we combine in that picture, we combine data from multiple sources. We have a, a statistical model that shows that most of them show a very con, a con, uh, consistent ordered behavior with one point that clearly is an outlier and maybe one other point, which is an, it, another outlier. So you flag those points and you go track down what's wrong with them. And, then, and any of you can get use out of that, that approach, regardless of whether you ever get into trying to, to, to estimate physical chemical properties the way I'm going to describe momentarily. All right, so the project objectives were simply to apply those types of models to PFAS. And, in, and we're going to take, I'll explain the approach in the next couple of slides or uh, more fully. But I want to point out two things that we know going into this that are going to be tricky. One of them is that the carbon fluorine bond is, is a problem. It's a little unusual. And they're going to be anions. And, 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 the an, and anions are not very well uh, developed in terms of these, these statistically based models. So we, we started out trying to leverage the work that Dominic Dutoro had done in a previous CERTA project, ER1734. And he, in that, for that particular project, he developed models that would predict a variety of different physical chemical properties for contaminants. In this one example I'm showing you here is for a bioconcentration factor for worms. And the, the application of that particular project was to insensitive munitions and, and, or, and legacy munitions. And that's what all the colored dots are on the right. The, point here is simply that we were hoping to just simply take what he developed in this project and apply it to PFAS and then be able to describe or predict the properties of all PFAS quite readily using those models. And so this is the guts of what they what we were trying to do. Initially, we have a, an equation which is in the middle there, which is just a, a, a set of linearly connected terms where the lowercase numbers represent system properties and uppercase letters, sorry, uh, represent uh, solute properties. And what DeToro figured out in the previous project is how to estimate those uppercase letters from, from chemical structure theory, so it's from quantum chemistry. So you can do this fully in silico, hence the title of the slide and the title of the talk. But as we get started doing that, we realized that that was gonna be difficult to do. 
Um, and so it, for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into in detail, but the results were not accurate enough. And so we were looking for a way to get around that. And the breakthrough came when we, when we, when we uh, realized that we could use the equation that's shown there in the middle. And what's on the y-axis in the figure is the first term in that equation, log KSW for the anion. And what's on the x-axis is the first term after the equal sign, which is log KSW for the neutral. And as you can see, the data that are shown there show pretty nice straight lines with a slope of one. And in, in offset, it, uh, offsets from the one to one line, which is the dash black line, which are, off, which are determined by these other three terms, this one, this one, and this one. And so that's a huge simplification for us because now all we really need to do is predict the intercept. And so if the first part of that intercept is just the partition coefficient for the protons, that's one number that we can get from other ways. And so now our challenge is to be able to predict the pKa of these things and, and, and different solvents. And now that's, a, that's not easy, um, but it turns out that we've had great success doing that just recently using a different kind of predictive model which is based on uh, stretching frequencies from, I, from ion, uh, IR spectra. And you can measure those or you can calculate, calculate them fully from quantum chemical theory. And either way, those, go, those can be used to develop a predictive model that's illustrated on the right. And, uh, and this is working quite well. So we can now estimate the pKa's of all these carboxylic acids and by extension, the corresponding PFAS compounds. And so here's just a quick illustration of, of what, they, um, what, what those predictions look like and how they compare to the data. So our predictions are the, are the red uh, triangles, diamonds on, on this graph. We've superimposed predictions from a variety of other models, most of which were not designed to predict for perfluorinated compounds. And as you can see, they're pr producing a similar, not much dependence on chain length, which is the spread on the y-axis there. The chain length is listed on the, on the right side of the, of the figure. Um, but the thing that really jumps out is that the experimental data, which are the black vertical lines connected by gray bars, are, are often very different. And this really highlights the fact that the experimental data are, are really, it's a, a problem. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that those numbers are wrong. We think that they're mostly just measuring something different than, 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 they're, than they were nominally supposed to be measuring. And so we're working on playing these two things against each other to resolve those ambiguities. But so now to bring that back, put those two pieces back together again to apply our model to predicting KOW for PFAS-like compounds, Here's an example of how the results are starting to look. So the, the correlations I showed you two, three slides ago are now in gray and on red, we've superimposed some numbers for, for a, a selection of perfluorinated carboxylic acids. And as you can see, they're behaving in a consistent fashion. So we can begin to use those to start to make some predictions. And, and I'm showing you just a, a snapshot of, of how that's headed right now. And, is, and it's, it's gonna be interesting because we have very little reliable data for anything like KOW, just like we don't have much reliable data for PKA. And so we don't really know how to ground truth this model yet. So we're playing them off one another again. And so this figure has, it's a little complicated, but it illustrates the, what's going on quite nicely. So the, the diamonds are the experiment, nominally experimentally measured values. The uh, squares are model predicted values, our model being the green one, other people's models being the red ones. On the left uh, cluster or vertical uh, column is PFOS, and on the right vertical column is PFOA. And there's obviously many things you can do to, to discuss this, this figure. The one thing I'll just point out that's, that's really fascinating is that the trend is opposite for experimental and model predictions. So for the experimental uh, measurements, PFOS tends to be higher than PFOA. For the model predictive values, it's the reverse. And with this point, we don't really have a hypothesis for that, but we'll use that in a diagnostic way in order to be able to try to figure that out soon. All right, so to uh, summarize, P the first initial main point, probably the take home for most of you on this ultimately is simply that these PFAS compounds are all 
almost all ionogenic. And so they're either anions, that's what I talked about today, but the same thing applies to cations and sweater ions. And so all their physical chemical properties need to take that into account. They're not the properties, the relevant properties are not the properties of the neutral species for the most part. Also, it's very clear that the data that we have right now for, for any of the PFAS species are of unclear uh, reliability. And there's a lot of work to be done on that. Now there's increasing numbers of places you see tabulations and summaries of values, but, but the QA, QC on that, uh, on all those numbers has a long way to go. And, and finally, that you can all use correlation analysis to validate the numbers that you're looking at, regardless of whether you're talking about physical chemical properties or, or, any, or anything else. Uh, finally, in terms of benefits to DOD, uh, clearly the, this, the benefits are conceptual that it, for the most part that I've presented today, uh, particularly with respect to this issue of the, the uh, ionogenic nature of PFAS. But these property prediction models ultimately should be a very powerful way to fill the data gaps that with reliable numbers for the PFAS family. And then one ought to be able to put those numbers back into a fully complete uh, reactive transport or, or environmental fate or PBPK model and to simulate what happens to these compounds in, in complicated systems in real life. So with that, um, I'll just uh, end here with the additional re resources. I, the beginning part of my talk was kind of built on some work that I did years ago, a paper I did some time ago, that's in environmental science processes and impacts. It's an open source paper, so you can get to it from that link or you can ask me for it. And, uh, and so you can read about the generalities of, of the correlation analysis thing there. The middle part of the talk leveraged Dominic de Toro's work on ER1734, and he gave a webinar on that uh, about six months or so ago. And, uh, and if you want to watch that whole webinar, you can follow the link to get back there. Also, we're going to assemble a, a variety of these presentations that we're giving on pr uh, property prediction for PFAS into a YouTube channel and a playlist on a YouTube channel. And you can find that on my at my spot on YouTube, and you can find that just by Googling my last name. And finally, the guts of what I presented today is going to come out in two papers, one first author, Tiffany Terralba Sanchez, and the other one, um, Jimmy Morello. And, uh, and those are not quite ready yet. So if you want to get a head start on those, you can request the preprints from me directly or, 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 or just keep an eye out for the final report from CERTA. So with that, I guess I am finished and I'll take questions that, that the time allows. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Paul, for a phenomenal presentation. And just a reminder to everyone, please submit your questions using the Q&A box on your screen. Paul, we have received a number of questions and we will be relaying those to you right now. Uh, the first question is uh, from um, ACOM. Have you estimated uh, PKAs um, or PKA value for sulfonamide compounds like uh, fifosa? And if so, how does it compare to the PKA values for some of the carboxylic acids? Yeah, that question is exactly the kind of question that we expect to get hammered with in the very short term. Now that we have a model that's, be that's working for the limited set of compounds that I talked about, the obvious thing to do is to apply it to other variations and other types of, of, of backbones in the PFAS family. We haven't done that yet. So short answer is we haven't got to it yet, but, but we, we, we could and we hopefully will. Great. Uh, what is the target date for completion of your project so people can know when to check back for a copy of the final report, Paul? I recently promised the final report to start up in September. So that's, that's, that's the short answer. Great. Um, all right. Uh, several questions uh, are coming in related to one of your statements on the conclusion side, uh, slide about PFAS being ionogenic. So you mentioned that, but you mostly discussed results related to anions. So the yes. first question is, what about the cations and the zwitter ions? And the second question is, are PFAS equally as ionogenic in, in air uh, compared to uh, groundwater or soil? 
Aha. So the first part of the question is, is easy. It's got more or less the same answer as, but is the first question I got, which is that absolutely everything that we did that, that I've talked about today about that focused on the anions should be applicable to the cations or for that matter, even the Zwitter ions. But for the cations, we simply haven't got to it yet. And for the Zwitter ions, it's going to be a bit more complicated because there's two things going on there and, and we haven't got to it yet. Now for the, for the second, uh, so the second part of that question, that's way more complicated. So um, in general, we think of uh, uh, neutral species as being the only things that are volatile. So in the, atmos in the atmospheric compartment, it, it, the only chemical contaminants that are floating around up there should be neutrals. And in the water, they can deprotonate and become anions, and then they can be in, in, in the aqueous phase. And that, that is a general rule. That's 98% of all you need to know. But there are some, some complications there. So for example, the PFAS compounds can adsorb to atmospheric particles and be transported in the atmosphere when they're not actually in solution in the gas phase, right? And that could be as the protonated species, or it could be in theory, it could be as the, the ion pair that I alluded to in about my fourth slide. So I don't want to go too far with that. There's a whole bunch of really subtle and interesting chemical questions there that, that most people have never thought about. And there isn't a ton of, of, of rigorous work that's been done on that yet um, in, in environmental systems in general, because it never seemed that important. And now that it might be proved to be important with PFAS, I would expect there'll be much more on that soon. But right now, we don't really know uh, more about that. Thank you, Paul. This next question is from the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, and given that correlation is a um, measure of linear association, do you expect the relationship to be linear or could they take nonlinear forms? Well, uh, well, first of all, keep in mind that everything I showed you today was were, were simple linear uh, a, a linear model, but but they were multivari the multivariate models. So there's multiple linear terms. Uh, um, the so there we're not doing any nonlinear correlations here. There and there's no prospect on the horizon that we're gonna that that's gonna come into play here for this the scope of what I presented today. But I'm I'm hedging because. Uh, in the broader context of structure activity relationship development for, for chemical properties, just in general, for, uh, there are nonlinear models. And there, and there are nonlinear models that are purely statistical in their, in their justification. And there are mo nonlinear models that actually can be defended based on theory. And so there is a space for nonlinear models, but the, the bar is very high to justify those. And, and so we don't expect to go there for, with, with this. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this next question is from EPA. Um, you stated that predicted and reported values for PFAS and, and PCAM are uh, suspect. How do you think these less Reliable values can be replaced or updated with more accurate ones. Yeah, so the well, the kind of the first half of that question um, is is uh, we we struggle to try to pick the right words with this, right? Because we don't want to be pointing to anybody's numbers and say we think that person those numbers are wrong and et cetera. We're not we don't need to get into that game in part because I think the numbers are what they are and they're they're more or less right in a sense in many cases they simply are measures of different things and and the so the where the inconsistency arises comes back to this whole issue of taking into account the speciation of the pfas if you look very carefully at where a lot of those numbers come from it's unclear what the speciation of the pfas was that they were trying to measure and it's even sometimes appears that the authors that did the work weren't really clear on that so it's not that the numbers are wrong, it's just that they're not the same thing, they're apples and oranges. And so our whole correlation analysis and modeling study here partly should be able to resolve all of that. 
So now the second part of that question was uh, was um, a little bit more ambiguous in the sense that I think I think what what they they were getting at was how are we going to how are we going to get past all that into a, a single uniform set of reliable numbers? Well, um, there, there's a couple different aspects to that. One one of the maybe the simplest one and maybe leave it pretty much at that is that um, what part, the road that we're headed down right now is what in the, in the statistical realm is referred to as meta-analysis. And, uh, and basically what you do is you systematically uh, combine all the available data, work through a whole bunch of different considerations and come out with a recommended set of numbers. And, and it's, a, it's an art, and, so it, and it's still a work in progress. I would point out that that EPA Comp Talks website that I that I referenced way in, near the beginning, they already have that built in, and so they do they do in some places they do provide what they call recommended values, but I think if you look carefully at the PFAS entries, you'll find I didn't check this to be honest, but I think you'll find that they haven't really done that yet because they're because they're just not ready they're you know not prepared to 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 stick their necks out on that yet. Great, thank you so much, Paul. All right, this next question is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, and it's related to seeing research suggesting that protein influences absorption to particles in soil and sediment. So the uh, individual uh, is asking, Paul, do you have any thoughts in relation to your work uh, on this whole protein uh, influence? Uh, as it relates to the, are you taking that into account when you determine the physical chemical properties? Well, um, I'm not gonna tackle the, the, the specific question of the, the effect of proteins on those particular in that work. Um, but what I will do is I'll just make a general comment about this. And, and if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in this, again, I would say go to that, that paper that I referenced in that I wrote in the ESPI because I, I try to develop this pretty fully. The, the, the way that, that that kind of issue, the, the, the effect of a, of a modification like the presence of, pro, of a protein it, is best handled in the context of chemical property prediction uh, is, is done with attention to just simply where do you put that, that effect? And, and so you can put, you can factor that effect into the response variable, which in this case would be the, the KOW, or you can factor that effect out and put it over on the other side of the equation and then try to describe it with a model. And this, this is pretty, pretty, um, sort of, abstract uh, point that I'm making here, but, but it's pretty profound. And, and so, so my overall response to that question is that the effect of something like protein on partitioning can be handled in a number of different ways. All of them are potentially okay and correct. The crux is to really understand which one you're doing and be clear about it and communicate it to the audience. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, one last question before we transition to Chris's presentation, and we'll try to get to, to the rest of the questions that have come in for you towards the end, depending how we're doing on time. Um, this is a question about fugacity. fugacity. Um, where does that type of approach fit in for these compounds? Is it a feasible one? Is it not practical? Have you considered it at all in your work? Oh, sure. That fits totally in here. I just don't, I'm not using that terminology. So, so I, I could have in, in the first two slides that I showed two different uh, models, a, a reactive transport model and a PVPK model. I could have used a figure from one of Dom, uh, Dom Mackay's papers on fugacity model level three or whatever, whatever the number he uses. It could go right there. Or um, with those models are parameterized and they use things like fugacities and such as their parameterization. All of that fits the same theory that that underlies what I presented today, just with slightly different definitions, but it's totally compatible. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to answer questions and we'll come back to you towards the end. But at this point, we're going to transition to our second presentation, which will be delivered by Dr. Christopher Solis. 
Um, Chris is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and director of the Environmental Science and Studies Program at Towson University in Maryland. And prior to that, Chris held different positions, uh, both academic and non-academic. Those included uh, a role as an ecological risk assessor with EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs. He also served as a toxicologist with the U.S. Army Public Health Center and an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Toxicology at Texas Tech University. Uh, Chris's research has focused on understanding the effects and risk of anthropo anthropogenic uh, chemicals to algae birds and reptiles. And since 2010, so for over a decade, he has been working on evaluating ecotoxicity and ecological risk of PFAS using field research, lab toxicity studies, and risk modeling. Chris received his doctorate in toxicology from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Chris, please proceed. Thanks, Rula, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, Paul, for a great presentation. And, and I'd like to thank CERTA for inviting me to present and all those folks out there uh, in the uh, interweb uh, that are paying attention. So um, this is just kind of an overview of my talk. I just want to highlight that this talk is not uh, about detailed modeling efforts. I think that's forthcoming with this effort. Um, but I will make the point that it kind of dovetails nicely with what Paul presented and kind of represents that other pillar that he, he mentioned. So looking at bioaccumulation considerations in fish of, of PFAS and at sort of a different scale than what we've been talking about so far. So a lot of folks on this call are interested in PFAS, I'm sure, and are aware of them as emerging contaminants of concern. Um, and in a lot of cases, and in a lot of states and maybe some communities uh, where folks are living, uh, there are fish advisories for PFAS. And these are because concentrations of PFAS, certain ones like PFOS or PFOA, are high enough in fish tissues that uh, there's concern that people that eat those fish uh, may be exposed to you know, unsafe levels of those chemicals. By extension, for those of us that are interested in ecological systems as well, not just human health, there's concern that um, there could be adverse effects to ecological systems associated as well with uh, PFAS exposure. So my entry into this field um, started with a project at Barksdale Air Force Base uh, where we were in essence characterizing PFAS in this system. And the system could, is characterized basically as a, an airfield uh, on the left with two former fire training areas where aqueous film forming foams had been used historically. Uh, and that's where those blue arrows are pointing to. And then there's a body of water called Cooper Bayou that, that flows right along that airfield. And we were exploring um, and measuring PFAS in water, sediment, and biota in that Cooper Bayou and kind of generating ideas and hypotheses as to what goes on in a system like this. And it led to what I think now is a pretty um, well accepted conceptual model for how, you know, where the PFAS came from in this AFFF use scenario, right? It came from using those, but generally in the terrestrial environment on land, if you will. And then th the way that they get into water and then, um, you know, expose receptors like fish, amphibians, et cetera. And so if there's use on the surface in the near term, there can be say a runoff event. And certainly there are examples of that in the literature and there's a large pulse of PFAS in surface water that then di dissipates with time. Uh, alternatively, alternatively, there's the idea that these chemicals are applied and used on land. They sort of soak into the soil, permeate down eventually to groundwater and then are transported to surface water. This latter scenario, I think, is really important for cases where there was a lot of historical AFFF use. And it also points to the idea that there can be ongoing releases, if you will, of PFAS to surface water, and which then could result in exposure to receptors. Because uh, the soil ends up holding on to, if you will, uh, PFAS for a pretty long duration, and then it's sort of 
depending on the chemical, more, or, you know, more slowly or quickly released to groundwater and then to surface water. So some of our data from that effort had led to some of the hypotheses of our current project, which will be most of the subject of this webinar. And this is PFOS, PFOS concentrations in that Cooper Bayou at different locations. And we sampled about once a month over the course of a year, or once every two months really over the course of the year. And what this points to is within that same system, there is both some temporal and spatial variability in PFAS concentration. And if we were thinking about, okay, well, let's build maybe a predictive model for what the concentrations are in fish, um, this is, could be an important factor that concentrations vary in the environment in space and time, which may influence you know, what we use, what kind of numbers we use and, and generate for uh, use in bioaccumulation models and try and understand what's going on in a particular system. Um, just to kind of complete this figure, this duration box is about uh, three months or something like that, I think, just to kind of provide some perspective on how these concentration data may relate to toxicity data that, you know, would be a relatively long duration study for an aquatic organism. So some other key findings from recent efforts in our lab and also uh, in the field at large related to PFAS exposure and um, bioaccumulation in fish. So on the left is a figure from a paper that was published in 2021 and from a previous or ongoing or, or finishing sort of project. And the goal of that was um, to kind of identify if we could quote unquote representative PFAS mixtures in surface waters of Air Force bases where AFFF had been used. And um, so we had data from a, uh, a number of installations, I think more than 100. Uh, so looked as a kind of a meta-analysis of the data available from the Air Force. And what we found was that indeed there is, you know, somewhat of a representative mixture that accounted for, you know, 80% or more on average uh, of the sum PFAS. And it was dominated by PFAS in that gray bar, followed by PFHXS. And then those other colored boxes are, you know, other PFAS. But in, in large part, a lot of the mixtures that we saw in the concentrations were generally dominated by PFAS and PFHXS. And this is just to give us a frame of reference in terms of how, you know, the chemicals that we automatically start thinking about as we're approaching uh, a contaminated site that where, you know, AFFF historically had been used. So, and then I pulled up these figures uh, from Burkhardt in 2021, who, uh, did a review paper pulling bioaccumulation factors. So these are um, field generated bioaccumulation factors, which is in essence a comparison of um, concentrations in fish tissue divided by concentrations in water. And what we see um, is that there's actually quite a bit of variability. These are log BAFs on the uh, x-axis for fish tissues either in um, concentrations of PFAS or PFH success in muscle or whole body, and they range over several orders of magnitude. So this kind of provides a backdrop, um, you know, a sense of the chemicals that are, are important at a lot of uh, AFFF sites, uh, and also uh, the range of bioaccumulation factors that we see from the literature, suggesting that there is maybe a lot of uncertainty associated with these. So just to kind of summarize uh, this background, fish are important receptors. They have ecological, economic, and cultural value used widely in monitoring. And now we're starting to see more and more kind of consumption advisories for, P for PFAS. So understanding bioaccumulation in fish is important. It can help us refine management goals and objectives and also refine human and ecological risk estimates. So that brings us to our current project, which is focused on PFAS bioaccumulation in fish. And we're taking a physiological, ecological, and environmental perspective on um, determining or trying to better understand uh, this process. And we have a three pillar approach involving field studies, laboratory studies, and bioaccumulation modeling. And today I'm gonna to talk really about some of the results from one of our field studies. And it is very much the kind of that 
you know, that larger scale kind of perspective. And then hopefully at the end, I can make the argument that you can see how some of there can be real great opportunities for synergies for projects like what Paul presented and also what he referred to with Dominic de Toro's work. Uh, I'll acknowledge my collab collaborators, Dr. Jamie Susky and Jennifer Field. And also I wanna mention that Abby Brown, my grad student has presented or generated a lot of data that I'm gonna talk about. And so this is just kind of a schematic of how those three pillars relate. They're more or less interconnected. That is field studies, lab studies, and modeling studies. And so our field studies, we have two different sites, one uh, generically called Air Force Base Creek. And in essence, there's a creek uh, at this Air Force Base. The, the airfields are above the picture, but they drain into a creek uh, that then flows uh, through that wooded section in the middle and then eventually out of the base. And then on the right is the Navy Recreational Pond. And again, the airfields are more visible in this image, but they're uh, higher up on the image and sort of similar kind of process. There's, there's movement of water and drainage towards that Navy recreational pond. And I'm gonna to talk today about one set of data from the Navy rec pond. So here on the right is, a, is the image again, kind of a closer up shot of the rec pond and the four sampling locations. Uh, the head, which is where we believe water generally comes from or into the pond. The spillway is where it leaves, and then there are two wings, the south and the north. And so those are where we sampled for um, surface water and sediment over the course of one month. So we were doing sampling three days a week uh, for a month, trying to get a better understanding of how or even whether PFAS concentrations vary over short time and spatial scales, because you can easily see across this pond. And so the figure here is some PFAS in surface water. Um, and for the most part, you see that concentrations are fairly consistent through time, even though there's a, a difference, right? The head is generally higher than the other locations in the pond. Uh, but what happened is serendipitously, there was a rain event uh, that occurred and we saw a pretty big shift in those concentrations especially at the head. Uh, and so if we look at PFAS by itself, uh, it looks similar. The, the, concent the, the concentrations on the y-axis are a little bit lower, but if you just think back to the previous slide, it looks similar, right? Again, pointing to the notion that in this system where there was a lot of historical AFFF use, uh, general dominance by PFAS. Now, if we look at PFHXS, the story gets a little bit more interesting even, which even though the scale doesn't allow us to see it, but for the most part, the concentrations are fairly consistent and generally lower than what they are for PFAS. But then after that rain event and a few days or maybe even a week after that rain event, there was a large spike. And what we think is happening here is that that rain event in essence can work to, on the, on the maybe in the short time frame, dilute uh, concentrations that we would measure um, and in the longer term, there's maybe a movement of water that then releases or pulls PFHXS, which binds soil less tightly than PFAS, from the, you know, the, the soil and then into, into the pond. Now, that's just a hypothesis. We uh, can't confirm that because we didn't do the necessary measurements. Um, but nonetheless, it's an interesting hypothesis. When we look at other PFAS, and I'm just kind of lumping a bunch of other PFAS that were measured but not reported here just for brevity, um, we see here again general dominance by PFAS, except after that rain event, things kind of get twisted. We see also that other quote unquote PFAS increase and that there is again that sharp increase in PFHXS. And this is just at the head. Mind you, the other locations in the pond were generally more stable and consistent through time. So, um, and this is an example of that. This is the spillway. So the, in essence, the water right before it leaves the pond. And you see a little bit of fluctuation of PFAS in, in, at the spillway, but generally um, they're much more consistent. Now, when we look at sediment, the story is also, I think, pretty interesting. So the orange curve and the black curve represent the head and the spillway, respectively. And first off, those concentrations are higher 
than the north and south wings, if you will. And second of all, there's a little bit more variability there. And you know what we hypothesize is even though if you walk up to this pond, you can't necessarily see much of a current, there is nonetheless a current of water kind of moving from the head and then across the pond and then out the spillway, right? And so there must be maybe some deposition of um, PFAS along that transect um, in the middle of the pond and maybe less so at the sides. But pointing again to this idea that it's, there is spatial variability and to some extent um, temporal variability in this as well. So here are just some example data of PFAS in fish tissue. So the system, the biological fish community in the rec pond is fairly simple um, in terms of being really just dominated by largemouth bass and bluegill sunfish. Um, there may be a few other species, but these are the species that we encountered most commonly. Um, and in essence, our sampling, uh, we divided that into small bluegill, which are basically prey species, uh, larger bluegill, and then larger, and then largemouth bass, most of which were, were pretty large. And then these are concentrations of, of a variety of different PFAS. And, that, and I didn't really want us to focus on any of the details just to show you some of the data and you know you can kind of glean some inferences about comparing small bluegill versus larger bluegill and largemouth bass there are a lot of similarities but if anything sometimes we see a pattern where bluegill the larger bluegill are a bit lower than small bluegill and largemouth bass when we look at PFAS only the, there's less of a difference among those three groups and the concentrations again are higher the previous graph, if you didn't notice, topped out at about 100 nanograms per gram. Here we're you know, at or above 1,000 nanograms per gram. And, and this is in muscle tissue, I should have specified that. So an interesting exercise that we can do, I, I showed this data earlier from Burkhardt where he pulled uh, bio bioaccumulation factors from a bunch of uh, studies. And so we can map our estimates of bioaccumulation factors uh, from the study that I just showed you and to see how they compare. And our data or our estimated bioaccumulation factors from the mean um, muscle or whole body concentrations are those rectangles that you see on the right side of the screen. And for the most part, they map to close to the center of the respective curve if it's a whole body or um, muscle tissue estimate for BAF. And you know, this is good. When we saw this, it was like, okay, this is this is promising because our data are mapping to you know pretty good frequent estimates of bioaccumulation factors seen in a range of studies from the literature. Now we can also do this exercise where we can say, well, what if when we sampled, we only sampled a single point in time and a single location in time. And we can run this exercise where we can estimate bioaccumulation factors using different components of our data, both in the fish and in the uh, water, estimate the bioaccumulation factors and see how they map. And those are the red rectangles. And when we do that, we can see a much wider uh, range of potential bioaccumulation factors. So this, you know, I think points to kind of an interesting uh, idea, which is that first, again, these con the concentration of these chemicals can vary over relatively short spatial and temporal scales. And then depending on how we sample, and then if we go to estimate a bioaccumulation factor, which arguably is the simplest bioaccumulation model one could generate, um, we get we can get very very different answers within the same data set. Okay, so that kind of gives you um, I think a pretty good perspective on our field efforts, and maybe you're seeing ways that there are opportunities that we can look at and apply different models and see how they how they perform. And I should mention we have similar uh, data sets available for the Air Force um, Base Creek and two more sampling events for Willow Grove. So those sampling events were at different times of the year, at different seasons. And so at the end, we hope to have a really robust data set uh, to kind of explore this idea of spatial and temporal variability. I, don't, I didn't present any of the data from the creek, but there are some interesting things that we've learned already.
Um, so the next series of slides are about what we still hope to do, and we're going to be starting some bioaccumulation uh, or accumulation and depuration studies in the lab to estimate uptake rates and depuration rates that we can then apply to or, or use in models to help, you know, kind of understand uh, um, bioaccumulation models and how they would apply to our field data. And this is just a schematic. The details are not really important, but we're looking at several different species that we have encountered in the field, bass, sunfish, and also catfish, exposed to a mixture of PFAS that are informed by our field studies, and looking at temperature and salinity as important environmental factors uh, that vary in these systems, um, and we think might be important with respect to uh, accumulation of PFAS. And then for catfish that have a more flexible diet, we'll also look at the influence of diet on uh, uptake and depuration of PFAS. So in the end, we're hoping that all this data can be used to, to really explore and maybe identify some great bioaccumulation models that can, that can facilitate a risk assessment and, and, and environmental management. The, the end goal would be the most predictive model with the fewest parameters and assumptions. And there are some great existing candidate models, simple, even simple one compartment models that we've applied to our data at uh, Barksdale Air Force Base worked fairly well. But there are a whole other variety of models, uh, bioaccumulation factor adjusted models, protein binding, and that kind of came up in the, um, in the last talk in the question and answer. But you know, those thought to be very important with regard to PFAS bioaccumulation. There's also been some um, work with phospholipids. And there are other modeling constructs, multi-compartment models that incorporate growth and physiological processes. Uh, one has been published recently, I think, that shows promise. One of the points I'll make is that a lot of the data that we have um, on uptake and depuration has been with rainbow trout. And so at the very least, we are hopeful that by looking at some other species that are pretty common in a lot of environments, like sunfish are pretty much found everywhere, um, that we're adding, we'll be adding data that other, other people can, can use and work with uh, and, and advance our overall knowledge. So in conclusion, uh, I'll make the case again that PFAS concentrations vary in space and time over relatively small scales. And I think that that could be important as we approach this problem. For sites using AFFF legacy foams, PFAS is likely to be dominant. If we think about non-legacy foams, then the situation changes uh, somewhat. Uh, bioaccumulation factors based on average PFAS concentrations in our own data set mapped well to existing estimates. But then again, there's that if, if we were to pick certain points of our data, it may not map so well, or it could be more, on, more extreme. Um, and I think laboratory modeling studies will enhance our understanding of this uh, very much. And so uh, I think that the benefits of the DOD are an improved understanding of PFAS in fish, which can reduce uncertainty regarding exposure and effects and improve a cost, cost efficiency, right? If we can identify maybe at the very least, uh, streamlining our sampling designs and getting the best information to come up with good estimates or measures of PFAS in water, sediment, and fish, then that's a great thing. Uh, it can maybe help identify high risk or high exposure scenarios. And then I think there's a really great opportunity for synergies with other projects, like a lot of what Paul had talked about. Those estimates that he's working on refining can be critical and really valuable for bioaccumulation models and PBPK models in fish. So I think that what you're seeing in, with these two talks is kind of two perspectives, uh, but then also this really great opportunity for synergies uh, that will, I think, advance our knowledge uh, considerably. And I've already been in discussion with folks from, that, are, that are leading other projects uh, that, that we can work together on. And so, here are some additional resources, references to various uh, papers uh, and ideas that were presented. Um, and for more information on this specific project, there's this link and you can feel free to email me. It's probably the best way to contact me and I'd be happy to, uh, to respond and engage in uh, dialogue. So with that, I think uh, I'm, I'm finished and available for questions. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, great, great presentation.
And along the lines of what I asked Paul, when do you expect your final report to be downloadable from the link provided here? Well, I think that this project is slated for an end in 2024. So it'll probably be that it'll probably be summer of that year. Okay. So in the interim, if people have additional questions, they can reach you at the contact information provided here. A absolutely. Yeah. Great. So we did receive a lot of questions. So let's start with one from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. You mentioned on slide 49, when you were talking about bioaccumulation modeling, that there's a lot of variability. Given such variability, how can a model uh, be utilized? How do you limit uncertainty? That's a great question. And I think that um, the answer is to trying to better understand the sources of variation. So in one sense, um, and in part, that was, you know, what we explored with those field studies, right? How much of the environment and the PFAS concentrations vary, because that obviously is going to is going to have an influence on then um, output models or the output of models and how well they map to reality or data. And then also, I think Paul's study hit some key points as well, right? It hasn't necessarily been easy to estimate some of these physicochemical properties, which then are, the, are why or, or how the chemicals bioaccumulate. So, you know, I think addressing that uncertainty at multiple scales will help us reduce the um, variability in the models and the outputs. Great, thank you so much, Chris. This next question is from the Colorado School of Mines um, related to estimating the uh, BAF. Um, so it states, it seems better that, it seems that to better estimate the BAF, water and sediment concentration must be measured across time to obtain a truer time-weighted average. However, often these values are based on very limited field sampling. Do you believe that there is a need for more extensive guidance as to a minimum uh, data collection uh, guidelines for determining more reliable bioaccumulation factors? Ooh, good question. I, I think that it could be possible. Um, so, that that um, we have to think maybe about that, about how how well our sampling matches up, you know, with with what it is that we want out of it. Um, and I, I think the data I, I showed kind of point to that. Um, and even the data from Barksdale uh, Air Force Base, which has done previously, maybe point to that as well. And we will have more data. Uh, and I will reserve kind of like a final answer to that question once we're able to kind of assess, you know, what, what is, is it something we always see when we sample, um, you know, do we see a lot of variability in space and time, you know, every time we kind of do one of these month long sampling events. Um, and I think that, you know, I'd feel better about providing my opinion on whether guidance is, you know, additional guidance is needed, but I, I think that there's probably enough data to suggest it's worth thinking about uh, right now. Like, I guess for me to say, you know, I'd probably be uncomfortable basing a decision off of a single measurement of, of right? If we had sampled out of the north wing or south wing of that pond, we would have gotten a very different impression of what, what might be happening uh, in that pond. But a reserve kind of my final, you know, and then again, fish might be really good integrators uh, and kind of, uh, maybe wash out that signal to some degree uh, because they're moving around because they're they're integrating the environment through time, uh, and we hope to address some of that uh, with some of our future work. So, but that's a great question. Thank you, Chris. Um, this is a question from Tio Syntax regarding the fish tissue PFAS um, studies. Uh, it looks like you measured fillet tissue. Is that the case, or did you measure whole body concentrations as well? So we measured that is so we measured whole body concentrations in small fish that had to be <clears throat> basically pooled and ground, and then for larger 
specimens, we measured uh, muscle, um, liver, and gonad. So we did not do whole body for the larger uh, samples. Great, thank you so much, Chris. This next question is from AECOM. Can you comment on the duration of the uptake curve for PFOS and whether the pond is stopped and whether this is a factor in field data for BAF? When, can it, whether the pond is what? Stopped. Is it stocked with fish or are the fish indigenous to the pond? Oh, no, it's, well, so it, I think it, what happened at one point, it might've been stocked, but it, it is not stocked any longer. Um, so that, that is a bracked site. So there, there's less access than, and use than there was historically. So that, that community there is in essence, quote unquote, natural, meaning there's not, a, there's not a lot of fishing pressure and there is no stocking. Um, so this is a great question. If you look at the data right on PFAS uh, accumulation, it happens relatively quickly, which is why, in a sense, uh, another reason why I was kind of interested in PFAS concentrations over relatively short spatial scale or time scales. So, you know, PFAS, PFAS accumulation occurs in a matter of weeks. Um, and so it, it occurs relatively quickly. To me, that is suggestive of the fact that, you know, if there's a lot of variability over a relatively short time frame, then that could influence your estimates of bioaccumulation, or maybe, you know, depending on how those match, the, the timing of accumulation, uptake and accumulation versus, you know, how the concentrations vary in time. Again, fish may be somewhat of an integrator. So one of the elements that I wanted to kind of explore was an individual based model. So where the fish, you know, typically bioaccumulation models are what I would call static in terms of there's kind of a concentration in water or concentration in diet. And then uh, that is what's used to estimate the concentration of fish tissue. But these are, these are varying, the fish are moving around, they're doing different things. Maybe they're moving to the head and to the wings and so, uh, you know, I was interested in exploring the fish as basically varying as well to see how that might influence our estimates of, um, you know, fish tissue concentrations. Getting at that, you know, the, because the, the accumulation is, is relatively rapid, if fish are moving in and out of certain areas with different concentrations of PFAS, maybe that influences the tissue uh, concentrations. I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive response. Um, one uh, additional question has to do with precursors. Have mm -hmm. you considered precursors and how do, and if you did, how do they fit into the current bioaccumulation model for fish? Right. So I think that in, in simple terms, right, the precursors generally go, um, get transformed to um, like PFOS or PFHXS. And as I recall, there's examples in the literature where you can see the, that signal in fish tissue. So the short answer is yes, I think precursors can contribute to body burdens of you know, those terminal PFAS. We have in our data set, some measures of some precursors. And so we're hoping that we can look at that, but we haven't had time to really delve into that to present it in a coherent way. But I think that, you know, my sort of simpleton view is that yes, they're, they're, likely, they're likely important. And the reason why is that because they'll show up as signal, signals of those terminal PFAS in fish tissues. Thank you, Chris. Um... You talked about data from two field sites and your two field sites uh, that you described are really quite different. One has a stream that you talked about and the other one has the pond. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights into how these differ and how uh, the information you collected could be extrapolated uh, or to, to understanding PFAS in, in fish more comprehensively? Right. So the, it was by design that they were different to try and capture um, 
those differences, right? Because there are very different systems. Um, luckily, we have some similarity of species, so that's helpful. Uh, and then we did the same sort of spatial and temporal uh, analyses or are doing them. Um, so hopefully we'll, once we start delving into that data, that we'll be better able to address that question. Um, yeah, that's, and that's pretty much the best I can do. I think that by having the different sites, and, you know, we can look for commonalities. And if we want to apply some models to those field data, that again, gives us a great opportunity to, to see how they, how they match up. If they work better in one system than another, uh, that kind of thing. Thank you, Chris. And maybe one last question before we pull um, Paul back in. This is a question from the Ohio State University. Um, and it has to do with uh, long chain PFAS binding to the organic carbon present in sediment. Uh, given that, have you considered measuring the organic contaminant in, in sediment? Uh, in, in your studies? The organic contaminants or the organic content? Organic carbon. The organic carbon yes. content. Yes, we, yeah, and we have. Uh, uh, we have, we do have, um, that has been measured in bo at both sites. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Sure. So for the last few remaining minutes, just a few overarching uh, questions. Both of you talked about the um, fact that CERDAP and ESCCP encourage cross-project collaboration. So Paul, was this the case for your project? And if so, what do you believe was accomplished? Sure, so two, two sides to that question. So on the, on the and the, the uh, aspect of just populating the world with, with reliable data, um, this project fits kind of right in the middle of a number of things that are ongoing. And, and so, as I emphasized, it's an outgrowth of a prior CERTA project with Dominic Toro. And what I didn't mention is that Toro has a new incoming CERTA project that really is going to take these types of predictive models and apply it more specifically to fish in collaboration with some people at EPA and Duluth. And so that's going to bring him right up close to the to where, say, Chris's project, I guess, picks up. So in that sense, there's a lot of synergy there. There's a, there's also um, even more broadly than that, uh, you know, these these physical chemical properties that we're dealing with apply to everything. I mean, they they come up in every different possible context. So just to give you one very quick example of that, in in principle, the models that we're developing here could be very effective for predicting chroma, chromatographic retention times to to help with analytical chemistry. You know, we haven't really got to that, but it's to, it's totally totally it's a natural outgrowth of where we're at. Great, Chris. What about your project? You you alluded to it, but can you uh, quickly summarize, please? Yeah, sure. I think that. Um, for this project specifically, it's, it is looking at the output of projects like Paul's and Dominic Totoro's to see how, uh, and you know, I've already uh, reached out to Dominic Totoro and are waiting for one of his papers to come out. Maybe it has already, um, but there are just op great opportunities to, to work together to apply um, models and ideas and parameters that are estimated uh, from one project to another. We've um, in a project that I'm involved in related to fluorine free foams, as an example, you know, the collaborators uh, come together and I think they're successful in publishing a paper. Um, so I think that in general, sort of, uh, in my experience, has fostered and encouraged collaborations that I think really help advance the science. Um, so that's, and generally, uh, the, um, the PIs have been pretty, you know, very willing to work together. So uh, I think it really does help advance the science. And I look forward to, to those types of interactions. Great. Thank you, Chris. And Chris, what is a last message you would like to leave our audience with today as we wrap up? A last message? I would yeah, take a I would, take away message. Yeah, I, well, I mean, with with respect to what I presented, I would say that uh, it's like almost every sort of take a message with PFAS starts with it's complicated. Um, but 
it, it is right. And then, so just with some of my work, uh, there is, a, you know, there's some important spatial and temporal variability considerations uh, that we need to think about. And to the one question about monitoring and collecting data, you know, I think that's something that we need to think about. And then also that to, to recognize that there is this really great potential for synergy among projects focused at different scales, like, like you know, the, the work that Paul's doing and the work that, that we're doing, uh, there's just great opportunity for that and th that there should be some forthcoming really interesting work. So I'll leave it at that. Great, and Paul, would you like to add anything um, to this? Like what is your main takeaway? Well, only, only this, um, skimming the, the questions that came from all the participants just now, I see a lot of people have, have really internalized the main point that I was making about how, how all the properties that determine the fate of these compounds are dependent on the speciation of these chemicals. And they're usually anions or cations or sweater ions, and they're not neutrals. So people got that message, but at the same time, people were coming in with questions that amount to what are we gonna do about that? And of course, that doesn't have a simple answer. But if everybody at least has that clearly in mind when they think about their sites, then 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 this presentation was a success. Right. Well, again, thank you both for amazing presentations. It is time to wrap up. I'd like to remind you that our next webinar is on Thursday, May 19, on DoD-funded research efforts to improve natural resource management with unmanned aircraft system technology. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Susan Cohen from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Mr. David Delaney from the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Registration is open, so please visit our webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars through the end of the year. And again, before we wrap up, you're gonna get a pop-up uh, directing you to a very short survey, which is instrumental in our planning process. So we would appreciate it if you can take a moment to complete it. Um, and uh, finally, both the audio, as we've been putting in the uh, chat box, both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be posted to our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer them to them in the future. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your participation.